Welcome back, everybody. This is Illiterate. This week, we are covering Wednesday on Netflix, the Addams Family spinoff. My name is Evan. I just checked out the pilot episode. I'm hanging out with my buddy Taylor. Hello. I looked into comic strips, because that's where this starts. Good lord. Have you ever wondered what the difference between the Munsters and the Adams Family is? Because I sure have. <laughs> Probably uh, hourly, I, I think about it, yeah. You know, on the tip of my mind at every moment. Uh, so, yeah, welcome. Welcome, everyone. That's what we're chasing today. Wednesdays has exploded uh, onto Netflix, uh, shattering some records. Uh, the most watched thing in a week, beating out Stranger Things. Directed by Tim Burton. He's back in the saddle, matched with some material that's right up Tim Burton's alley. What more could you ask for? Um, <laughs> so I'm yeah. excited to get into the ne- the nitty gritty here uh, on what the Adams Family really is, because this is a storied franchise that has a long, long history, and I am baffled. I am baffled that audiences are are <laughs> flocking in droves to this thing. This has new, yeah. ta- you know, hot talent in it. This is like it, it. This is I'm baffled that something like this is popping quite the way that this is. Um, so yeah. come along with us. We're going on the journey of the Adams family. <laughs> Here we go. The uh, like you said, with the most hours viewed in the first week. That's just it. Seems insane. Where, where Stranger these Things, I'm like Stranger Things has from, many, yeah. so many seasons, and I'm like it has, you and know that's what I Netflix. mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like this bizarre. is bizarre, bizarre. But the the other bizarre thing, the best of Adam's family that it did, just to to wet your whistle for, well, this is weird. Is <laughs> it's also the best selling pinball machine of all time? The Adam's oh, good. family <laughs> themed pinball machine. Which why? Who knows? But doesn't matter. <laughs> It you just, know, uh, it just surprises works. you at every turn. <laughs> it just wherever yeah. you see a pinball machine, it just works with the decor. <laughs> yeah, and people loved it in the in the nineties. Yeah, got so Adam's that's... family, and then like the creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, those right next saddled next to each other in the wooden line corner of some dive bar. I mm-hmm, across this there country. Yeah. Well, let's let's uh. Let's see where it started. Like I said, comic strips, which I was not aware of, but makes sense. What I didn't realize was so long ago, 1938 was the wow. first wow. Adams Family cartoon. The cartoonist Charles Adams, so he used his own name. So and we're in the throes the- of, of monster horror cinema, really. This is this kind of yeah. just to seeing where cinema is at in this in this realm too. I'm like, we've got all of the universal stuff going on right at this moment. This is fascinating. So maybe he was he had his finger on the pulse of that. He wrote only 150 single panel comics that had these characters, but drew 1,300 or thereabouts of just random others. He worked for the New Yorker. And the classic, you know, New Yorker mm-hmm, mm-hmm. single panel bits started this whole gig in 32 when he was only 20 years old wow. writing for the New Yorker. And that's all he ever did was was little comics and things like that. The one that I will post a link to, which is worth looking at, which he did in 1940 and is probably his most famous one, is this downhill skier. Somebody's... Mm looking at this guy skiing past and if you can imagine but please click the link there's a tree and he's just the ski lines in the snow have gone around the tree and the guy's like it just defies all logic where how do you split a person to go around the tree the ski lines stay loop around the tree and then keep going many cartoonists if you're if you inside cartoonists joke baseball they have referenced this plagiarized this mimicked this it's a classic single right. panel uh <laughs> cartoon so <laughs> that's that was his claim to fame outside of uh the adams family that 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 got him wow. clout in the, <laughs> the cartoon gotcha. world was this skiing one yeah uh <laughs> he the, the adams family stuff was inspired by his hometown of westfield new jersey which has big ornate victorian mansions and graveyards mm. and what was a buzz recently was that netflix ryan murphy show the watcher that yes. happened in Westfield, New Jersey. So you can picture that as his uh, big, creepy residential, absolutely <laughs> like big house. Absolutely, yeah. Let um, us know if you want an episode on that. We could do that, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, that's that's where he's from. And so he was interested in the macabre, but he really played up this image for his own sake as being a horror cartoonist, decorated his big house like a gothic castle, had a big (laughs) door knocker in the shape of a bat, had armor and axes and skulls in the living room and- Oh, good. Stuff like that, yeah. Hope as a child, cut his hair into a widow's peak. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, did all that stuff. He he loved the spooky stuff and- and leaned into it. So there are these urban legends, if you knew him around the time that he slept in a coffin and drank martinis with eyeballs in it and sort Sick. of adopted this <laughs> this this thing. <laughs> but wasn't really that way. But people like to think that he was as creepy as the the Adams family. Uh, wow. But al- along along with his general creepiness, one of his friends was Alfred Hitchcock as this uh, gains in popularity. He's got that Hitchcock, street cred uh, then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Hitchcock does some creepy modern Edgar Allan Poe kind of stuff too. I mean, so I'm thinking about the house in Psycho as very uh-huh. much, you know, very akin to the, the yeah. gothic uh, architecture I, I see in Adam's family. So Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a bit that Hitchcock references in relation to his friend. So this is in the film North by Northwest. Mm. And Cary Grant sees three of his adversaries together and says, the three of you together, now that's a picture only Charles Adams could draw. Oh. <laughs> Burn. <laughs> Got him. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he, he alluded you ghouls. to his friend. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's like, I didn't know. I mean, I hear Charles Adams. I don't know anything about him. But he does have a, a, a history in the in the in the world outside right. of his goofy drawings. No, at the um, time that made them love yeah. that because I, up until this moment, I would have I've been like, okay, cool. That's you know some, yeah. <laughs> some that's a reference I just don't get, but some artist of the time, uh, you know, I don't know what exactly yeah. what, but now I'm now I can go straight to always oh, calling them like ghoulish and creepy. And yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, with like you said, the, the the ghoulishness. The comic was these individual ghoulish characters that he started pairing them together. A lot of the the bits, I'll post a link to some of the the single panel stuff, reminds me, and maybe you can picture this too, the original mm. Shrek book that we talked about. Yes, yes, Where yes. Shrek is just kind of doing his own thing, and that's the Adams family. They, they, they think everybody else is weird, and they're very confident in their, their lives and creepiness and whatever. And the, so uh, the yarn continues to unravel on 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 Shrek though to update that yeah. <laughs> uh, more and more material is surfacing of like the test uh, Shrek like the iterations of Shrek yeah. before he became Shrek as we know I think we talked about this a little bit but there's more and more of that is even surfacing since we talked about it oh last, yeah <laughs> but it's continuing it's it's it, shrek is love is life let's go on <laughs> yeah it's all over well I, I i looked into it even more because once you start hearing the word shrek you just can't get away and i was reminded <laughs> of looking at the original comics being like oh yeah the original shrek book we talked about how that was written by william steeg who mm-hmm. he started writing he did 2600 new yorker drawings also mm. and he and Charles Adams work together. They're, this is them oh at the exact God. same time. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> so they're like the New oh, Yorker wow. comic strip guys at the same time in the in the, in the the late 30s. Wow. Uh, the Adams family so and what, Shrek <laughs> hanging out. <laughs> yeah. What fun. The thing that happened with the Adams family now is we're moving into the adaptation stuff, which I, I found conflicting information on, so I don't know. <laughs> But I do know that – so the New Yorker, the editor at the time, prevented Charles Adams from writing any more cartoons when the 64 series was going Mm. because the New Yorker in his mind is this refined readership and they don't want it to be associated with general network TV junk. (laughs) And Um. so he didn't want people to be confused and say, no, 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 this isn't isn't related to the New Yorker. Don't come over (laughs) here. So he did not – Not elevated enough for the New Yorker. Yeah, <laughs> he didn't get to do any. And then I, I the, the conflicting narrative is that he also didn't get residuals from the show. Mm, uh, what? He was what? involved in the making of it and he got paid for it, but then didn't get anything on the back end. But then I also saw Thanks, that he sir. lived. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> the producers and filming <laughs> make off with all the but rights. I, yeah. <laughs> God. I saw another article, though, that he lived happily off of his residuals. And it does make sense. Like, okay. how do you make an enough money off of New Yorker cartoons? Right. And that's all you do. Maybe. I okay. Don't know, so maybe he did. Then. Maybe he did. Then. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't, okay. I, I bet he did. I, that would that would see. Yeah. That would seem like it, kind of impossible, or some, almost something you know, like, got. Yeah, something got renegotiated, maybe right, or something. Right. But as far as let's, I guess let's go into the TV series. Yeah, which I I have never seen any of really. Um, yeah, I've only seen it in passing. Um, and then this is exactly where I get it confused with the monsters. <laughs> and I and you can yeah. probably show me slides from each, and I would tell you that they're the other. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's, I'm, I'm just yeah, yeah, being yeah. honest here. <laughs> I, I think I sided more with the monsters. That's just because what my parents knew more, but I'll, I'll, I'll lay out for you what I could find as the key differences and you will yeah. see, oh, they're completely, they're the opposite. Definitely. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting for it that. to be yeah. so I've, the most obvious thing. I'm like, okay, like Frankenstein is in one and not the other. Right. <laughs> I don't, but yeah. maybe I can't remember. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> like yeah. in the Frankenstein I'm thinking of is also the pet cemetery guy. Don't go down that road. <laughs> so like that's the one I yeah. have very little <laughs> I'm connecting. I'm really struggling. <laughs> <laughs> so let me lay it out for you. We won't go into all because there's 14 different TV film adaptations well, of the Adams family and, and one Broadway. But I'll just we'll hit the main TV series and the highlights. There was no recognition of them being the Adams family. Like I said, they were just loose characters that he sometimes paired together in the New Yorker strip. They didn't mm. even have names. So this is all coming out that of one. nothing for the TV show. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Who saw the potential was, uh, was David Levy, the producer in Manhattan. He saw a cartoon book in a shop window with this on the cover. This is always funny to me because it's like, oh, we could make a live action sitcom out of this. What do you, you know, how do you, how do you make that connection? But I guess if you're a producer who can see gold, it's so funny that just that you mentioned that and, you know, I'm skipping the, the, the man, we'll come back to this, but, uh, you know, you mentioned that I, one thought while I was watching the new show and I started to ponder the difference in when you make the decision to make something a cartoon or when you decide to do something live action and what you're trying to say about the reality and how you're trying to connect the, the audience to the reality. Is it supposed to feel like uh -huh. reality or am I heightening our reality? Am I taking us to a cartoonish level and how do I actually motivate you? So I was pondering all of that, not really even knowing that the Adams family comes from cartoon panels. <laughs> I was not, I was not aware yeah. of that at all, but I was, <laughs> I was pondering that exact question while I was watching the pilot. So this is fascinating to me because this, I think, is in the DNA of what I saw on the screen in terms of, well, it is a cartoon. It is cartoonish. That is part of the reality here. Yeah, well, they definitely were considering some of the cartoonish stuff that I could find in the series and probably just the function of it's cheaper <laughs> to do it live action <laughs> or that's what's what's popular at the time. But Charles mm -hmm. Adams did work with the script writers, which is why he gave it his own last name because mm -hmm. they didn't, <laughs> didn't have any names or anything. But like some of the stuff. I mean, it's his, right? Well, they're just characters. They're not a family, but they look like a family. Well, what's their family <laughs> name? Well, who made them? Yeah. <laughs> Me, <laughs> yeah. Uh, there it is. the the two The two big things that I could find that were different. Cousin It is the only new character for the series not created by Adams. That's the producer David Levy and his deal. Oh. Hmm. And then in the in the comic, I like the joke in the comic, which they don't do, and people may not realize. Things hand is not a disembodied hand. It's just the only part of him that's in frame because the rest of him is too hideous to witness. Oh, no. But they just make it a disembodied <laughs> hand for this for everything Adams family. But I like that joke that he's just out of frame in every <laughs> in every single comic. <laughs> Which I feel like you could do in in film and I wish somebody would. That would that's that would funny, be <laughs> it so would be funny. possible, but you'd have to. It would be so much energy and effort into that one aspect of it, which ultimately would go by unnoticed by design in some fashion. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Oh, that would be incredible. Um, I works. I, so they I, said, "Oh, this works really better for the cartoon." It. 
I mean, yeah. I see how it's obviously like it makes now nah, it should just be a disembodied hand. I get the the choice there, but the joke is hilarious. I'm really glad to have yeah. learned that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some some of the other stuff that's the unique qualities, let's get into the the Munster's different stuff. Because what's crazy about the timing is ABC airs The Addams Family on September 18th, 1964. They potentially shot themselves in the foot with their own competition because the day before that, they aired Bewitched, which is what? this husband hmm. married to a witch. And yeah. so there's they already got – and that the is genre, maybe the, the yeah. more spooky – note, you know, or more palatable to people. Yeah. But – we're bringing witchcraft to the suburbs. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. They already did it. What's wrong with you? The rival CBS, six days after the Adams family, airs The Munsters, which is another kooky family trying to fit in with <laughs> normal people. So, you know, oh people speculate. It's like, oh, they're competing. But it's like they had to have been in production at the same time. It's right. these. It's that that thing where it just is happening at the same time. They're so in the Munsters premieres how close to it? Six days after. Oh, my God. Within the week. Yeah. (laughs) The same week. (laughs) Oh, my God. Um, Yeah. What? That seems astronomically outrageously (laughs) by just coincidence. I just don't understand how that can be possible. Because I'm like, I know they're they're the same time. They happen at the same parallel. But I'm I'm bet on my mind, I assume one starts in January. Maybe one started the next that fall. Yeah. We're talking about no, no. six days apart. <laughs> yeah. Good God. They release. And then as far as the differences, the Adams family never drew high ratings during its run. So the Munsters was more popular. Mm. But I think the best way to describe it that I saw was that the Munsters are monsters, but are trying to act normal. So that's why you have the Frankenstein, the Dracula, right, the right. werewolf son. And they they want to fit in in suburbia, and that's the hijinks. <laughs> and this is also what Universal owns. They own the monster, <laughs> the monster <laughs> characters, so they can do that. The Adamses, however, are normal looking people. Not uh, you know, except for the hand, but like none of them are werewolves or Frankenstein's or anything. But they are eccentric. Mm-hmm. They don't care about. They're not trying to fit in. <laughs> right. They think everybody else is weird. So yeah, it's a yeah. it's a big difference. And and the way that you could see it as to what is more culturally relevant is that you look at the Munsters, it's a farce about a family of classic movie monsters trying to fit into contemporary American culture, whereas the Adams family has a bit more yeah. bite to it because it's a satire with a strange family that is trying to investigate the values of contemporary American culture. <laughs> they they think that that regular people are the monsters. <laughs> right. And so it's um, like the dad is trying to go into politics and they talk about literature and then one of the legal system and Beatlemania. There's they're speaking to all of the the cultural topics of the time with outsiders who are not as scared of who they are. Yeah, one is about assimilating and trying to be the same and one yeah. is not one is so assured and confident that it just doesn't even understand what you are. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's where probably if you look at the predominantly white American sitcom viewing audience who's used to leave it to Beaver, laughing at people who are mm-hmm. weird is easier and less deep than investigating mm-hmm. yourself. <laughs> They're not like yeah. us. They're a yeah. vampire and a Frankenstein monster, yeah. obvious. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess yeah. so. I don't mean to, yeah. to, to, <laughs> to reduce the monsters, though. Yeah, um, of course. But, I, I'm, but merely drawing the distinction here in terms of what they are attacking, what their mission is, what they stand to say, and how different that really is, what, what, what they're really geared toward. Because now that I'm picking it apart with you, I have, it's clear as day. And I mean, and they're they're almost yin and yang of the same. Yeah. one's trying to fit in, one doesn't want what doesn't want to fit in at all, and thinks that basically <laughs> the rest of society yeah. is the monster. So I think that's that perfectly valid. It's just fascinating that that these two things are spat out at exactly the same time at a very odd, very odd time too. I mean, we're talking about the early mid '60s. This stuff goes in. You know, they're developing through '63 at the late, and it's finally out in '64. Yeah, the it same is. week. And that's still really hard to <laughs> fathom. <laughs> I think the final distinction to get at with this main TV show that aired that 
probably threw people for a loop, but now it's what defines it and what people love is the fact that this creepy family that are outcasts that are also relatable because they're different, they stuck to what the sitcom tropes were of this is a great family. There are still, even though they love torturing each other, they love each other and they're friendly to the neighbors and outsiders. They're not trying to attack their neighbors. They're even naive when people don't, people run away because they're mm. scared of a giant spider. You know, they right. don't, they're a tight, close family that has a lot of grace for people. Not like Shrek that's saying, ah, oh, screw you, I'm evil. They, they're they they're welcoming true. to everyone. They're almost oblivious. And so, and so that is weird for people to, grasp with the fact that they're so creepy whereas you have the monsters that are actively trying to hide that and then the the one thing that they definitely don't hide which is odd for tv sitcom couples of the time is the sensualness and the active <laughs> love that <laughs> gomez and uh his wife have for each other is is uh some reason that sticks in my mind even though i don't know it very well i just i can visualize that and that's odd for the time to be so open with your late yeah. marriage I love mean, and sexuality it, and it, yeah but I mean, it makes total sense in a character's perspective in terms of what you're trying to say we just got through with the distinctions of these two things so it makes total sense mm -hmm. for for the adam's parents to be sexually charged and open and more <laughs> just assured and confident in that part of their life because the seems like yeah. on to follow the character through to to converse that uh the monsters would be you know shy and very guarded and you know they <laughs> would be hiding from any intimate details um yeah. very much like a, a, a culture uh, very much like a sheltered america um <laughs> so yeah. it, it actually makes total sense when you're thinking about it from just the character perspective running in the opposite directions with what the two differences of those two properties are that the Adams family would be openly more sexually charged because that challenges <laughs> that that is yeah. a that's a bit challenging to a suburban regular American audience. And it's interesting, but it's risque and naughty. But oh, but it <laughs> should this be on TV? Um, that this and then ultimately yeah. it reflects yeah. in the ratings of uh, what people were just more comfortable with. This is fascinating too mm -hmm. because this has nothing to do with like what's good or bad. This is just showing you where mm -hmm. the audiences swayed just based again 1964 people. Oh, <laughs> yeah. We have we've come a long way. So, um I I I'm, I'm seeing the the way the 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 waves worked here in the waters and it makes sense uh, that audiences might have shifted towards the monsters a bit more because it's a bit more safe. It's a bit more easy to laugh at because they're the monsters. Ha, they're, yeah. You yeah. Know, instead of making the <laughs> monsters out of ourselves, it's a bit harder to do that. You have to be a little bit more you know, comfortable and confident in, your, in yourself uh, to be able to tackle some of that kind of stuff. So um, this, this is really fascinating. I mean, it all makes sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah how, how interesting it would be to put that much sexuality in a parental character <laughs> in 1964 primetime television. But yeah. that's exactly what that character should be doing, I guess, if that's the mission. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So hopefully that gives everybody listening to the distinction. You could tell your friends what, what the, what, what the two families represented. It, it only lasted for two seasons before it was canceled. Mm. Um, maybe also because a lot of TV was going to color at this How point. How long did the Munsters last, I wonder? The, yeah, the original Munsters was also the same two seasons. Wow. So that that's fascinating, too, is the appetite for this. Because <laughs> it's probably, I mean, how it's not over. The Munsters weren't like, smash hit overwhelmingly more popular it was just they were they were no. they were more popular to a degree uh but ultimately yeah. the appetite for that material only lasted a demand worth of two seasons <laughs> yeah and i think I, I didn't go deep into the monsters but they do have another offshoot and a standalone you know they try to well it feels like neither it, one has ever like been that. dead no, neither, yeah, neither, yeah. Series, neither franchise has ever been dead. I mean, and to that point, Rob Zombie's Monsters just came out <laughs> this fall. Oh, really? So yeah. <laughs> it's oh yeah, absolutely. A brand new Monsters feature film. Oh god. Yeah. <laughs> put out by Universal is out right now. 
Um, so this year, the Adams family and Munsters are, are yeah. <laughs> getting they're right in the fold, man. They're right on each other's heels. They will never get away from each other. That's even more fascinating is that this long afterwards and it, <laughs> somebody like they Rob Zombie coming along and they're still somehow cosmically linked at the hip. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's wild. That yeah, is wild. I, I, like I said, I won't belabor you with the with all of the things. We'll we'll fly through how they get to Wednesday because the animated stuff does come through. the The Adams family does have an animated series in seventy three, which is them going on a road trip in their gothic, Sick. tricked out, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> National um, Lampoon's yeah. Adams Family vacation. <laughs> yeah, the next biggest things that I could see decade wise is 91 and 93 the feature films and yes. big successes and the revival of them was it live family action. values well that was the second one yeah the second yeah. one and this is uh where tim burton pops in because he was going to direct the oh, really? first one but then passed to do batman mm. returns which we covered yes so Interesting little intersection Very there. Interesting. The main actor who played Gomez, Raul Julia, passed away in 94. So that's what scrapped the plans for any more films, or at least mm. slowed it down a bit. Yeah. And then it was struggling through. There was a musical adaptation in 2010, which relies much more on the macabre, grim, less zany pratfalls of the show really? and more of okay. the comic strip. And that got two Tony nominations, did wow. over 700 performances. That was pretty big. And then- wow. yeah, massive. The, clo the, the next closest ones, these are the last ones, was the Tim Burton was going to do a stop motion with Illumination, which we covered in our Minions episode. Yes, yes, yes. R around the same time as the musical adaptation. But that got canceled because the stop motion element of it was lost- and Tim mm. Burton was no longer interested, and then the whole thing just fell apart oh, God, around no. 2013. But that would have been interesting. And I, I, I probably also doesn't work with yeah. Illumination knowing their business techniques of mm -hmm. <laughs> low budget, <laughs> uh, things like that. But I, I didn't realize, because I got confused, there were two animated films, one in 2019 and one in 2021. Right. Um, I forgot all about that now that you say that. But this, all gets, this all gets twisted around in my mind because there's also the Hotel Transylvania film. Yes. And it's which is kind of like the Monsters. <laughs> it's like oh even God. more confusing because that's werewolves and vampires and whatever. Yeah, but yeah, then yeah. the Adams family. Which one is had. Adam Sandler a part of? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably like, both. I, or, both. Yeah. <laughs> God. Oh, God. Yeah. So all that's lost on me until we get to this series uh, Wednesday. The the way that this got put together, Tim Burton is in, involved, of course, but the creators of Smallville are the showrunners. I mean, they've done other things, but uh, that's they're, they're mostly known for, for that. And they got the rights, gotcha. wrote a pilot, sent it to Tim Burton, oh, wow. and he loved it because he was like, oh, this relates to how I felt in school. It's a new take. I'm in. What? Flex these muscles. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So pretty cut and dry. Yeah. But it wouldn't have gone through, I don't think, without Tim Burton. But I think that is some of the criticism is it it gives off this CW teen drama vibe that right. maybe isn't as much what the comic strip or the original show had. And at that same level, I think that's exactly where I was ended up drawing the 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 animation elements of it where it almost mm -hmm. felt like a cartoon and that's because of i think that exact element um so i it was very it was very odd for me watching it because it did not feel like as much as it is it did not feel like tim burton the way that i think of tim burton necessarily i uh i was a little bit underwhelmed visually to to tell you the truth but yeah uh what i did get was some kinetic nature and some <laughs> i guess some uh yeah. some physicality that really had me pondering that issue of, of well when when do you try side to move something from uh you know some animation to a live action or vice versa yeah um well what i saw what i thought was interesting was these guys who did who are show running, did Smallville, 
it, it, talking about like the the kineticism and the the comic to movie stuff, they're responsible for the story for Spider Man Two. Oh, and working with Sam Raimi, which you and I both <laughs> wow, love. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. Know, the Spider Man films are are delightful, <laughs> and they really go. It's like, oh, this is a live action comic book. They really lean yeah. into all the comic booky stuff. So that was kind of interesting to me. Gotcha, yeah, that they that they do have some of that in their in their tool belt. And there's another Spider Man connection related oh, no. to the the Adams theme song. This guy Vic Mizzy worked from. The 1930s to 2009, he died at 93. <laughs> he was a, oh a, a, a beast. Um, yeah. Basically composed a billion famous songs from the 40s and 50s. Did also tons of TV jingles. The next biggest one besides the Adams Family would be the Green Acres theme mm. song that people would know of that era. But then mm-hmm. continues working, does film scores for thrillers in the 70s and 80s. And then one of the last things he did... Sam Raimi requested him to write and do this zany Spider-Man song for the outtakes on the DVD of Spider-Man 2. Whoa, what? And not, I, <laughs> yeah, and he did it. And so I'll post a link. Oh my God, yeah, yeah. If you like the Adams Family theme and you like this guy who's just written, written a billion things, That's it's kind of like, because it's seasonal, it's like Bob Dylan's Must Be Santa where yes. it's just, it just sounds yes. so wacky. It's just he's just riffing about Spider Man for oh, four God. minutes on this track, and maybe oh, it incredible. is in the blooper reel. I, I haven't I haven't seen the outtakes of Spider Man Two, uh-huh. um, but if not. <laughs> It works I don't remember. A, I don't know. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll song. see it. I'll probably see it and go like, "Oh my god, I have seen this." Uh, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but what a weird, what a weird ask to be like, "Hey, can you do a song for the bloopers?" <laughs> oh my god! Oh um, my gosh! I think that just about does. Um, <laughs> it's everything we could know about the Adam family. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know, it answered the big questions for me. I think I'm walking away with a huge respect for both. I mean, we, this isn't even about the monsters, and I respect the monsters more <laughs> now. Um, thank you so much, Taylor. I really appreciate the hard yeah, work. Thank you. Uh, guys, thank you for sticking around uh, to the end. It really means the world. Uh, reach out to us at illiteratepod at gmail.com, at illiteratepod on Instagram. Let us know what you're watching, what you're excited for coming out, and we will catch you back here next Friday. Till then, stay safe. We'll see you. See you then.